we must speak the truth about terror. Let us never tolerate outrageous conspiracy theories, malicious lies that attempt to shift the blame away from the terrorists themselves. Take you over the right. What happens? I tell you what happens. Blam! I have a window that looks directly at the World Trade Center, and I saw... No collusion! Shit's getting way too complicated for me. Yeah. Welcome to The Antidote. This is Greg McCarran. And this is Jeremy Rothko Show. All right, Jeremy, we are... We are two days removed from the arrest of former FBI New York field office head Charles McGonigal. Counter, counterintelligence uh, head, yeah. Counterintelligence head of New York field office Charles McGonigal on uh, charges from both the D.C. attorney's office and the District of Southern New York office. Um, and um, the, the one that's getting the most talk is the uh, New York indictment, which is related to um, Oleg Deripaska and uh, McGonigal and his um, translator, interpreter Sergei Shestakov violating sanctions against Russia and uh, we're going to talk about some of the um, the bigger picture surrounding this is it's going to be I think a more reading heavy intensive episode as we have um, Twitter Twitter threads and we're going to get back into Seth Abramson's uh, proof of conspiracy correct correct surrounding bigger more of a bigger picture surrounding this as it relates to once again just interconnecting it back into what we've been covering over the last several years and um, countering some of the media narratives that are out there surrounding this um, arrest and what it may or may not mean. Yes, and th- obviously this is like right in the theme of the things we've been focused on a lot actually in just our last few episodes in terms of the compromise of counterintelligence. And, uh, and so this is obviously a very big deal and everyone's trying to make their own framing of it and the sort of the MAGA centric crew is trying to say that all this proves is that the deep state that that created the quote unquote Trump Russia collusion hoax unquote uh, was comp what they were they were doing the Roy Cohn basically right that they were pointing the finger when they were guilty themselves or something like that and that that's what it's limited to. But what this actually points to is exactly what we've been saying for years and years and years and years, that what the actual issue with the 11-9 analysis and specifically uh, Trump-Russia analysis is that the combination of government elements and combined with the media elements, and now that's maybe there's a focus on mainstream media and like the biggest establishment media such as the New York Times, but it also has gone deeply into alternative media across the spectrum, that they were limiting the hangout. They were both limiting the depth and the width, the depth and the scope of uh, of exactly uh, how this went down, uh, putting Trump into power, and the, and the depth also and the scope of the reasons for it which were not, were not just to have an asset in the White House for policy region, reasons, although there was very obviously some of that. And that's where you can so blatantly see the Middle Eastern connection and the netanyahu Likud connection, but also the Russian uh, connection, but also for these much larger narrative warfare, cult, the escalation of culture, or dynamics and the way that it play, continues to play in terms of uh, political chaos and political destabilization. Now, some of the people in the alternative media, if they were to see something like this happen in a country that were to be seen as a target of the United States, they would see exactly uh, what's going on here. But for some reason, there's a, a total... Uh, willful or uh, dupefied blinder on in terms of uh, our domestic aspects. It's almost like playing down, I think. It's sort of de- it's a little bit dehumanizing actually towards uh, other countries like Russia and China and re- specifically actually in terms of like downplaying how how good they might be at the kinds of things that they say that the United States is good at, even if it's seen in a negative fashion. So we're going to get into um, – we're going to first go into a – the reason what we're, we're – we're including this as part of our series, our, our longer series on the 11-9 cover-up 
um, because this is actually a bit of a breakthrough in uh, both in terms of the the legal aspects of it, but also in terms of the media and potential public understanding of how and why the uh, Trump Russia investigation was compromised internally. And the location of this is crucial. And we'll go uh, further into this down the road in terms of New York, right? This is the, an epicenter. Remember what where uh, I pointed out how Jordan Peterson had uh, disclosed uh, some of the history, the, C, the, the CV of Netanyahu when he interviewed him that almost no other interview or had had uh, done with uh, Netanyahu. I would just point to two main things. Well, maybe three main things is one Netanyahu's background as the dawn of terrorism studies, maybe uh, in the West, uh, the key convener, the operative convener of the Jerusalem conference in 1979. And then the author of books and the promoter of the terror war before it became officiated, especially after September 11th. So, so that's one piece that Peterson uh, recognized his long-term uh, authorship of this whole area of concern and studies. Secondly, the his, his uh, veteran status as a special forces operator in Israeli uh, military, Osirat Matgal of reconnaissance forces where BB even repeats the line of going behind enemy lines. And now when you when you see BB all over American uh, media, you've got to wonder what is this is is this is this be does he consider the American media behind enemy lines too? Uh, and then thirdly, and this is crucial in terms of this uh, this story of a NYPD counterintelligence chief of the FBI. Uh, the the office there, uh, being from New York, right, the, is that Bibi in the 1980s, the bulk of it, right in the middle of the, were the most heated espionage moments. You know, Iran Contra, the uh, the b- becoming clear to the U the U S counterintelligence establishment that that there was a major problem at very high levels, very likely, the loss of uh, many intelligence sources. During that time, the rise of Jonathan Pollard. And where was Bibi this whole time? Bibi was the representative to the UN. So he was hanging out in New York. He was doing that deal. Also, when he got to know the Trump family, and not too long after he'd had a working relationship with Mitt Romney at a Bain Capital Boston Consulting Group. Very good point. All right, so this is, this is deep into the 11-9 cover-up here. And, uh, and so we're going to first uh, read a thread from the academic and author Timothy Snyder uh, about how he sees this Charles McGonigal uh, indictments in relationship to what he's been tracking um, for years now. And, uh, and then we'll move into some other stuff, including uh, proof of conspiracy. All right. This is a tweet from... Today, January 25th, 2023, Timothy Snyder, quote, in April 2016, I broke the story of Trump and Putin using Russian open sources. Afterwards, I heard vague intimations that something was awry in the FBI in New York, specifically counterintelligence and cyber. We now have a suggestion as to why. The person who led the relevant section, Charles McGonigal, has just been charged with taking money from the Russian oligarch Oleg Deripaska. Follow this thread to see just how this connects to the victory of Trump, the Russian war in Ukraine, and U.S. national security. The reason I was thinking about Trump and Putin in 2016 was a pattern. Russia had sought to control Ukraine using social media, money, and a pliable head of state. Russia backed Trump the way that it had backed Ukrainian President Viktor Yanukovych in the hopes of soft control. Unquote. I'll just, uh, I'll make a quick point here just to notice that here's one of where, and this is, you know, I noticed when we went on fault lines for, you know, on Sputnik's premier news show uh, in, in the United States for the morning, 
this is where they were very sensitive, was the actual political history, and specifically Russian political warfare operations in Ukraine and tied into Manafort. So the specific time scheme of like 2004, right? Mm -hmm. And there was two things that seemed to be, they got real uh, skittish around. One where they tried to actually muddy the water. Mm -hmm. That was where I was talking about the actual background of Manafort in terms of the potential rigging of the election and not just influencing per se of the stories of Manafort bringing Rose IT guru, Cyber, into uh, Mike Connell, who then gets uh, liquidated uh, apparently in a, uh, in a plane crash uh, as he's in the middle of being deposed, like uh, depositions are starting to fly hot and heavy around uh, investigations into the 2004 election and his network's role in it up to uh, Grove that Manafort had brought Mike Connell into Ukraine. So this question of election fraud, that especially one that connects via the player Manafort, the 2004 American election and the 2004 Ukrainian election was very sensitive. And they started muddying the waters at that point on, on Sputnik radio. All elections are rigged. Isn't that how it was said by Jamal Thomas? That's how he tried to dismiss it, almost like a conspiracy theory. Like, it, it, oh, this crazy conspiracy theorist thinks you, okay, so you think all elections are rigged. Right, you're exactly right, Greg. That's the way that Jamal Thomas uh, spun it. Then, when I got into the question of kinetic warfare, that's the way I put it, and I pointed out that uh, Yushchenko, the uh, candidate that Manafort was working uh, against, against the the Russian sphere uh, candidate Yanukovych, who he had apparently helped not only influence but potentially rig the Ukrainian 2004 election, that Yushchenko had been uh, poisoned via an Agent Orange uh, derivative, a dioxin uh, derivative. That, that immediately they that was like when Manila Chan. They seem to just sort of like immediately put a stop to that and we're not going to be talking about that. We're going to be talking about something different. So I just want to point out that in the middle of this, whether you're talking about 11-9 or 9-11, there is the, this is where it truly gets delicate for these types who are, who are still working in relationship to the mainstream in some way is when you actually get into like kinetic kinetic and like deep political operations, which would go from anywhere from election fraud to uh, assassinations, I would say, or attempted assassinations. Um, that's where things get uh, dicey. But other than that, this is all, this is very well established uh, background that people do not want to talk about. All right, back to Timothy Snyder. The re quote, the reason I was thinking about Trump and Putin in 2016 was a pattern. Russia had sought to control Ukraine using social media, money, and a pliable head of state. Russia backed Trump the way that it had backed Ukrainian President Viktor Yanukovych in the hopes of soft control. Trump and y Yanukovych were similar figures, interested in money and in power to make or shield money, and therefore vulnerable partners for Putin. They also shared a political advisor, Paul Manafort. He worked for Yanukovych from 2005 to 2015, taking over Trump's campaign in 2016. You might remember Manafort's ties to Russia from 2016. He and Jared Kushner and Donald Trump Jr. met with Russians in June 2016 in Trump Tower as part of, as the broker of the meeting called it, quote, the Russian government support for Trump, unquote. And he references his book, Road to Unfreedom, page 237. Manafort had to resign as Trump's campaign manager in August 2016 when news broke that he had received $12.7 million in cash from Yanukovych. But these details are just minor elements of Manafort's dependence on Russia. Road to Unfreedom, page 235. Manafort worked for Deripaska, the same Russian oligarch to whom McGonagall is linked, between 2006 and 2009. 
Manafort's assignment was to soften up the U.S. for Ru Russian influence. He promised, quote, a model that can greatly benefit the Putin government, unquote. Road to Unfreedom, page 234. While Manafort worked for Trump in 2016, though, Manafort's dependence on Russia was deeper. He owed Deripaska money, not a position one would want to be in. Manafort offered Deripaska, quote, private briefings, unquote, on the campaign. He was hoping, quote, to get whole, unquote. Road to Freedom 234. Reconsider how the FBI treated the Trump-Putin connection in 2016. Trump and other Republicans screamed that the FBI had overreached. In retrospect, it seems the exact opposite took place. The issue of Russian influence was framed in a way convenient for Russia and Trump. The FBI investigation, Crossfire Hurricane, focused on the narrow issue of personal connections between Trump campaign, between the Trump campaign and Russians. It, it missed Russia's cyber attacks and the social media campaign, which, according to Kathleen Hall Jameson, won the election for Trump. Once the issue of Russian soft control was framed narrowly as personal contact, Obama missed the big picture and Trump had an easy defense. Trump knew that Russia was working for him, but the standard of guilt was placed so high that he could defend himself. You know, I'm thinking about this, Jeremy, and the, uh, the narrowness of the focus. And even Trump, I think, might have played into that um, with his big theatrics about if Russia knows, Russia, release the emails if you have them. So I think that was all playing into this. Definitely. Well, that also might have been a, a, also a signal, too. Right, a combination. Of, yes. And as you pointed out to me, Greg, that, that I would always harp on the, this statement in the Steele dossier, which, by the way, is now also then, again, up for especially the sort of uh, Trump protecting MAGA sphere, uh, basically pointing out that there was a relationship, a working relationship between Steele and Deripaska before Steele uh, wrote the, uh, wrote the, quote unquote, uh, Trump Russia dossier. Um, and, but I mean, this is all speculative, but what it looks like to me is that Steele was um, working in relationship to people who he trusted in the U.S., including people in the FBI that he trusted in relationship to trying to uh, bring in Deripaska, turn Deripaska, influence Deripaska, get information uh, in that way. And that's all the question, the complexity of the question of that background uh, will be very uh, turned into some kind of monolithic scenario of these were all the deep state working against this outsider Trump and pointing the finger at him because they now have four, you know, or three fingers pointing back to themselves in relationship to Russia and these specific uh, oligarchs and all of that. But as you pointed out to, to me, Greg, uh, that this thing that I harp on about, um, about the Steele dossier is that it points out that, that the Trump campaign itself would be happy to focus, to have the focus on, on Russia in order to uh, bait people away from looking at even deeper foreign entanglements and uh, co potential corruption and compromise, including uh, China and then he says also others. And so we think obviously the, the obvious one obviously is Israel and Netanyahu and then there's the the relationship that became with the Saudis and the Emiratis, uh, obviously, but the others too. But then the Chinese are the ones that are frontally uh, centered by Steele as who the Trump campaign would be happy to talk about Russia so that they don't have to talk about the uh, Chinese connection. Remember this whole thing with like this actual Chinese bank account uh, and all of that. That should be talked about again with the sort of the coming the asking of the question of Biden and UPenn and uh, Chinese investment, or as we've begun seeing too, the question of Daily Wire and uh, Chinese investment in terms of the, um, the uh, purchase of the Wilkes Brothers uh, frack tech, uh, looking very much like a sort of like just a, maybe a 
two-stage uh, compartmented uh, purchase in the billions of dollars uh, by high-level uh, Chinese uh, officials, basically. Uh, and then, So then you begin to think about this whole China-Israel relationship and then how that played into um, the 11-9 operation, potentially. And so the, the, there is this question of Chinese influence that's sort of hanging in the background that's usually obscured by these sort of fake hawks on it, such as a Ben Shapiro sometimes, right? All right, back to uh, this Timothy Snyder Twitter thread. All right, quote, once the issue of Russian soft control is framed narrowly as personal contact, Obama missed the big picture, and Trump had an easy defense. Trump knew that Russia was working for him, but the standard of guilt was placed so high that he could defend himself. Unquote. And I just want to point, I just, you know, Obviously, one of these things is Rod Rosenstein, his infamous, you know, alleged quote of I can land this plane and then being the deputy attorney general who was in place to define the scope of and then require some accountability from the Mueller investigation. And now, of course, there's a lot of spin trying to spin away from what even the sort of the limited hangout uh, and limited scope of the Mueller investigation actually found. Right? Remember, the Mueller report had two pieces to it. One was the question of, quote unquote, collusion, which the Mueller team uh, interpreted in a legal fashion by was there a threshold to prove um, active conspiracy uh, amongst the any individuals in the Trump campaign and the Russian government, I think, you know, or, or sort of Russian nationals of influence, right? And so that's a, a pretty high bar when you think about, uh, you know, you're talking, not talking about a civil case. Civil case has a lower threshold of uh, a proof where you get into things like uh, the uh, predominance, I think predominance, um, or the weight. So you're talking about like either 51% or something two thirds in criminal law, where you're trying to prove a, a criminal conspiracy, you're now dealing, you have to be up above 90%. And then if you're talking about a, someone like an American president, there's no way that someone's going to, uh, indict on a uh, question of, you know, can I convince a jury to 99, you know, percent. Uh, that this was a criminal conspiracy. So, and then you go look at the background of someone like Rod Rosenstein, seems to have been a leader in the prosecution back during the Iraq war of a CIA Iraq whistleblower. Uh, and then also then Rod Rosenstein then jumping into uh, legal service on behalf of Israeli military uh, cyber intelligence uh, warfare tool, NSO group and their Pegasus. Uh, spyware um, directly out of that. And then so this then points out that this this missing piece of the Middle East and Israel specifically in terms of the 11-9 operation, and that you've made this point, Greg, a lot, that it serves actually as a way to uh, bludgeon down the rest of the thing. And while some people will be afraid to even talk about it, then they'll sort of like harp on Russia in a way that's not accurate and then others will focus on it because it's the Jewish state or it's those, you know, it's the Middle East. Everyone knows that's where the conspiracies are. And it can't be Russia. Everything is just sort of Russia being framed or something like that. But it's much, it's much wider. And that's what the facts uh, point on is actual international collusion. And one last thing I'll point out is that in my interview with um, Seth Abramson about uh, proof of conspiracy, I... Uh, made the point to him, and he pushed back in a fair way, I thought, but I made the point to him that part of the issue with all of this is that we're obviously dealing with an intelligence operation. The 11-9 operation is an intelligence operation, so intelligence operations are designed to be plausibly deniable, even from public knowledge, let alone legal thresholds of, of uh criminal, uh, you know, prosecution. 
And and then Abramson doesn't deny that point, but then he says, but sometimes we learn uh, counterintelligence information, intelligence information from prosecutions, which is true. Also, this is some of the information we actually have about Paul Manafort and his actual bank accounts, for example, and who he owed money and uh, how he was trying to make himself whole. A lot of this comes from the actual criminal prosecution uh, by the by the Mueller team of Paul Manafort. All right, back to this Twitter thread by Timothy Snyder. Quote, it is entirely inconceivable that McGonagall was unaware of Russia's 2016 cyber influence campaign on behalf of Trump. Even I was aware of it, and I had no expertise. It became one of the subjects of my book, Road to Unfreedom. The FBI did investigate cyber later and came to some correct conclusions, but this was after the election and missed the Russian influence operations entirely. That was an obvious counterintelligence issue. Why did the FBI take so long and miss the point? I had no personal connection to this, but will just repeat what informed people said at the time. This sort of thing was supposed to go through the FBI counterintelligence section in New York, where tips went to die. That is where McGonagall was in charge. The cyber element is what McGonagall should have been making everyone aware of in 2016. In 2016, McGonagall was chief of the FBI's Cyber Counterintelligence Coordination Section. That October, he was put in charge of the Counterintelligence Division of the FBI's New York office. Unquote. By the way, remember that the, you remember this big New York Times story in the in the fall of 2016 time uh, frame had this big old headline that said that said the FBI said that uh, sees no something direct link between uh, Trump campaign and Russia right and that sort of put everything to bed to some extent for for the people who would usually think you know to look a little bit further that's interesting the FBI counterintelligence section where tips went to die. Um, it's very interesting because it reminds me of, um, we talked about this a little bit, uh, either today or yesterday, uh, but uh, it reminds me of the um, FBI, the coordination between um, the prosecutor of the Southern District of New York, Rudy Giuliani, and the uh, FBI, and the, um, the taking the controlled takedown of the Italian American. Uh, gangs, the, you know, the Gambinos, Columbos, et cetera, um, that took place in that time period and almost like what we call the replacing of the Italian American mob elements with the Soviet immigrants who were, I believe that was said to have been like, uh, they made the Italians look very uh, nice in comparison, I think is almost uh, how I've heard it described. Uh, and I, I go back to thinking about that and uh, that just not so much the quote of where tips go to die, it just makes me think of long term. Uh, you know, we keep talking about the term collusion, but there's long term levels of um, of influence and uh, control mechanisms in place with uh, these particular networks surrounding. I mean, of course, we talk ad nauseum about Giuliani, but uh, just reminded me of the um, of of a type of operation like that of the coordination that would be at play between certain people put in certain positions to make this um, change in terms of the uh, face of the international, multinational uh, mob operations and all that would come with that money laundering, et cetera, right in uh, Trump's uh, city of New York City. I, I just made me think about that again, just to reiterate that. Definitely. And the other thing that I was thinking about in relationship to that is that when we we were talking uh, in a recent episode about the uh, the Soviet spy via Czech intelligence who had been swapped out for Natan Sharansky, and the 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 man who was in charge of the prosecution of this spy and his wife was Rudy Giuliani, and it was infamously known that the the Justice Department and the FBI screwed up the case in certain ways, so they weren't able to actually um, con uh, convict as deeply, I think. 
but they 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 conducted the investigation and the prosecution in a way that dirtied up the uh, evidence fruit, right? The uh, corrupt tree. Uh, I forget what they call it in legal doctrine, but like the way that uh, via uh, like a Fourth Amendment violation that all evidence after that can be then thrown out the the window. So uh, th- this is this is some bit of proof positive toward what you're saying in terms of the actual background of Ru- Rudy Giuliani at a crucial time in terms of apparently mucking up counterintelligence uh, cases that would uh, not only involve something like the Russian mob, but it would actually involve Russian espionage. Uh, so that's something I thought about. The other one is that this, what we've talked about a lot before too, is that the New York Police Department is notoriously known as uh, the probably the closest non-governmental or non-national level entity in the world to the Israeli security state. They, they probably, you know, there is a massive like bulk there in terms of this, you know, the, uh, the deadly exchange in terms of policing and, uh, and then remember police intelligence units uh, in relationship to the Israeli security state. And then you just got to mention then this question of we, you know, this is something that you harped on, Greg, was where was Giuliani in the run-up to uh, the the uh, 2016 election, I think it was. And he was doing cyber, he was doing a cyber conference in Israel. And then uh, we, f- we reflected on the fact that that was an interesting uh, rhyming resonance in, historically with where uh, Giuliani's uh, police uh, chief was in the run-up to the September 11th attacks in New York City, Bernard Carrick. Just, you know, even probably around the same time that is the Israeli state-owned company Zim Shipping moved out of the World Trade Center, breaking a lease at a $50,000 penalty, indicating to certain uh, FBI, uh, counterterrorism, counterintelligence, able danger investigators that there was something maybe going wrong and something to look at. Around that same kind of time frame, Bernard Carrick was uh, in some shady, into some shady business uh, in Israel. And remember, he even got he got convicted, Bernard Carrick, for taking uh, basically bribe money uh, from a businessman. And one of the the uh, cash flows was back to a major Israeli billionaire, uh, Eitan Wertheimer who's chief of staff for many, many years, it looks like, is a one of the early graduates of the Talpiot program. And it's this, this was some of the framework that we were tracing out in relationship to our 9-11 to 11-9 series. And I was, I was sort of asserting, if maybe just implying, that, that there was some evidence here of that the that, that Talpiot program, Talpiot did 9-11 in a certain way. Now, that would, of course, take a much bigger macro forensic-based approach to all of that, but that was some of the framework of not only the timing of Carrick, but then who exactly, who exactly was he uh, talking to and who was he apparently being, uh, you know, selling himself uh, out to. And these are these kinds of relationships. This is a very similar kind of amount of money that McGonagall uh, apparently, you know, is selling himself uh, out for. Uh, that Carrick was, you know, a few hundred thousand dollars in that realm. Okay. That's a great point. Yeah. The uh, Giuliani fancied himself. Um, I don't think it was an official position, but he was almost as like an unofficial cyber czar for the uh, incoming uh, Trump administration in that late 2016, early 2017 time period. And I would also think, Jeremy, it's logical to think that the same network, uh, Giuliani going back to his time as uh, the the prosecutor for Southern District of New York, Ons, who being the mayor of New York, with the obvious contacts both within the FBI, within the FBI, DOJ, and um, New York Police Department, that this would logically be the same extended network that Giuliani was um, so integral to with the narrative around Ukraine that became the the Hunter Biden laptop that was mis- that was. Mirac- that ended up coincidentally in the hands of Giuliani from a coked out Hunter Biden to a random laptop or a random uh, store technician into the hands of Giuliani. This smells of the same uh, network. And I mean, I'm sure if you peel back the layers, you can see that it is a it's it's certainly a continuity of operations. 
Definitely. And people might want to go back and uh, listen to our Antidote episode where we describe Giuliani's uh, trip to Ukraine, the networks that he uh, was involved with there. And it was both in time and in context related to what had just been uh, unveiled in relationship to the Kushner quote unquote peace plan for Palestine or, or whatever they were calling it. Um, so people might want to go back uh, to that. Something was about gunboat diplomacy. The uh, I don't know. I, we'll find it and uh, and try to link to archive of that that show to really get some of the the more granular detail because it hooks up to the whole background in um, in uh, in uh, Red Mafia how the Russian mob invaded America uh, and uh, and it, and so that of course that book then ends up with a focus on Mogilevich and the uh, Israeli 1995 to Tel Aviv uh, global Russian-Israeli mob uh, meeting there. And some of those figures were directly tied into then Trump uh, projects. Uh, I believe Trump Toronto being the one uh, most directly tied to the uh, 1995 Tel Aviv uh, Mogilevich and more uh, mob meeting. And then it also, there was uh, ties into the this Chabad network that's also, op- not only does it dominate Russia, but it's also fairly dominant in Ukraine. And it was it was actually a, a, like a Jewish community um, foundation or uh, one of these sort of uh, worldwide standard uh, Jewish community organizations that, um, that this uh, Chabadi, sort of Russian crime associated uh, oligarch that uh, one of the people that was brought Giuliani to Ukraine for his uh, information session uh, had started uh, in in uh, in Ukraine so there is there is a lot of themes that keep coming uh, back up here and sources that uh, deserve more attention all right Back to Timothy Snyder, a Twitter thread from January 25th, 2023. This is uh, number 15. Quote, we need to understand why the FBI failed in 2016 to address the essence of an ongoing Russian influence operation. The character of that operation suggests that it would have been the responsibility of an FBI section whose head is now accused of taking Russian money. Right after the McGonagall story broke, Kevin McCarthy ejected Adam Schiff from the House Intelligence Committee. Schiff is expert on Russian influence operations. It exhibits carelessness about national security to exclude him. It is downright suspicious to exclude him now. Unquote. I just want to point out that that I sort of understand his point. People will say that, well, you know, this is already going on. This was the Freedom Caucus had gotten McCarthy to uh, promise that he was going to eject these deep state Democrats uh, from these um, commissions. It was sort of a part of it was payback for Marjorie Taylor Greene in a way and part of it's payback for the January 6th committee. But but the, I, Timothy Snyder says it's downright suspicious to exclude him now, meaning that Okay, after this, even even let's say like according to MAGA, like all right, Schiff is this overblown or he's a fake expert on the Trump in uh, Russia. You would think you'd still want to have him on the table to get your experts to you know to uh, face him down or something like that. So that that's what I think the the larger point here that that it, it makes some sense to me. All right, number 17 of Timothy Snyder's uh, Twitter thread. Quote, back in June 2016, Kevin McCarthy expressed his suspicion that Donald Trump was under Putin's influence. He and other Republican members concluded that the risk of an embarrassment to their party was more important than American security. Road to Unfreedom, page 255. You know, I do wonder why Kevin McCarthy and Paul Ryan and Steve Scalise and whoever else was involved in that candid moment should be asked about that um i mean as far as like until answers are received should be asked about that um 
I think, pretty regularly, and they're never asked about that. And it was interesting, the two people who were named, let's remind people, were Donald Trump and then Congressman Dana Rohrabacher from California. And um, we have mentioned this before on the show, and I'm sure we'll mention it again, but let's go back to Dana Rohrabacher. Back in 2013, he basically, he told the story of, in the early 90s in Washington, D.C., him and uh, friends, including uh, the Scooter Libby, uh, Dick Cheney's uh, man, in, uh, early in the, 90s, right? You're yes, saying early this is 90s, the early 90s. So this is not, this is before Putin is ever become prime minister. Right. This would be early 90s. This is, there was not an exact time or date for this, but early 90s, this would have been in the fall of the Soviet Union. And then the coinciding with the rise of, beginning of the rise of the domestic culture war narrative and important relationships being, it looks like, um, Put together between American evangelicals in the po in post-Soviet Russia, but um, Rohrabacher and people who he describes as friends, including Cheney's chief of staff, uh, Scooter Libby, who was uh, jailed and then pardoned by Donald Trump, of course, um, among other people. I would like to know who all was there, but that Putin was in this game of uh, flag football. And then Rohrabacher talks about drunkenly losing an arm wrestling match to Putin, but uh, makes you wonder two questions, who all was there? And also, was there anything else going on outside of uh, Rohrabacher's innocent account of the of these events? So, I mean, these things do not come without consequence. I mean, what seems uh, even like if you think that seems like a joke, uh, Ryan and uh, McCarthy and Scalise, um, but two of which, by the way, are in primary positions of leadership in the new GOP Congress, quote unquote leadership. Paul Ryan, of course, bowed out and uh, I guess he's gone to profit elsewhere. But it does like even outside of like a, you know, this could be caught like some type of joke or something. I mean, when you look at not just Trump, but also the very like this history of uh, Rohrabacher, like it's not something to be taken as a joke. And uh, people with um, serious interest in how we got to where we are now and issues of national security, et cetera, that come with it should have more interest in this combination of this candid off mic conversation and this um, other history of Rohrabacher and his claims. Like it should be taken way more seriously and something we should hear more about than we do. Yeah. And I, I would, I'm interested in just like the fact that, uh, Putin is in the United States in the early 90s meeting with uh, eventually, you know, consequential uh, American officials. And I've never heard of Tr of Putin being in the country in the 90s other than this. So people can go and look and see if they can even find any other accounting uh, of this. And remember, this is like this is when Putin is making his way in relationship to, out of the, you know, out of a straight up KGB officer into the Moscow power uh, network in terms of the mayor's office in, in, in Moscow. And of course, all of the mob ties that, that surround that we've gone over from things like um, the um, Craig Unger's book about House of Trump, House of Putin, about the actual deep background of Putin in terms of when he was Pretty, you know, fairly young, coming up as a ju judokin with, uh, you know, members of like serious members of Russian Russian mafia, and additionally people who'd be potentially described as oligarchs, right? And remember, this is like one of our, you know, this is one of my main uh, criticisms of the of the way that uh, Whitney Webb, for example, in her books about the Epstein Maxwell network and the deeper background there that now a lot of it is good research material it becomes like a textbook for uh, a lot of the details surrounding a lot of this history that's important for understanding our 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 time right now and at the same time there's almost an intellectually dishonest way that she treats the entire scope of what she now even calls and interviews, you know, deep politics or the deep state. Uh, and it, it seems to be understanding of what we've been harping on in terms of Peter Dale Scott's uh, definition of the deep state and of deep politics and deep state as the intersection of the national security state, specifically clandestine operations, covert operations, black operations, and how it then relates, and in most of the time, you would think that it plays, it's the on top in the hierarchy, the way it manages a relationship 
and very likely you could say it's compromised by or something like that, its relationship with the underworld, organized crime, the black economy, transnational crime, syndicates, right? And Whitney Webb seems to totally blank out once it comes to the Russian sphere about, yeah, this is the definition of, of the deep state. She describes that Trump has a long-term, you know, apparent economic connection with the uh, the, Molagar, the uh, Mogilevich syndicate. She talks about Trump Trump's relationship with the Maxwell uh, sphere, especially maybe over the Epstein sphere, and then she w- wipes that all away by saying, "Well, this is Mogilevich is just the Maxwell." A crime syndicate. This is not has nothing to do with Putin. Now, by the way, you can go. You can find the videos of Mogilevich at the election center or wherever their election headquarters were. Uh, maybe my might have been a government building. In terms of uh, Putin's first uh, election as prime minister, he was there on the scene. Now, there's a lot more to that. But just the framework of understanding that, you know, that the oligarchs, when we're talking about oligarchs and, and, and mob and organized crime, we're talking about in this fashion, we're talking about assets of a national security state, clandestine operations, influence operations, compromat, clandestine warfare, political influence operations. That, of course, there's always going to be cutouts. There's always going to be ways of uh, exerting power in a way that there is plausible deniability and ways that that the the resources can be spread out. Remember, this is exactly what Maxwell was doing in relationship to the Mogilevich syndicate. He was giving them in. He, he helped train up Mogilevich to the black economics, to how to financially globally rig billions of dollars of money laundering because not only Mogilevich, but actually primarily Maxwell was involved with the head of the KGB in some of these operations, Kroichkov. And there's a whole bunch of history uh, there uh, in terms of all of that. So would, did, that, did, that, did that relationship with the deep state of Russia just go bye-bye in terms of Maxwell or Mogilevich? And what was Trump interacting with here? So this is sort of the thing with the oligarchs, right, that, that, that people, that Whitney Webb's not helping with, at the very least, in terms of helping this alternative media, much of what this information has been sort of suppressed uh, from them on purpose, much of it very largely just sort of organized Russian alternative media disinformation, a combination, I'll remind people of the, of the difference between an asset and an agent, right? This is basically saying that McGonagall, the eventual head of counterintelligence at NY, you know, New York uh, FBI field office, was an agent, an agent of Deripaska. And thus there's one chain there, you know, about to say that he's not, you haven't proven that he's an agent of the Russian government, right? But you've proven that he's an, or you're, you're alleging that he's an agent, a paid agent, that means sort of contractual, right, of, of this key oligarch tied into all the aluminum wars. Remember, that's a crucial moment, too, in the development of the, the new state, the new face of the, of the Russian state and including the shake, shaking uh, out of the, of the different uh, organized crime networks, the aluminum wars, right? That's Deripaska gets his start there. And by the way, Greg, right, as, as you kept pointing out to me, I didn't quite get the reference immediately at first. I'd be like, what do you, this is sort of, you know, what all the cover-up artists would say. They'd be like, but Putin disciplined Deripaska by taking his pen back on film. <laughs> you know, and so this is a good example, actually, of the way that, uh, you know, that public propaganda works and the painting of people in certain ways to sort of appeal to whole sets of understanding or misunderstanding. But this is a main thing that needs to be understood. Stood. 
but people would under the, the same people that refuse, like people who say there are not even oligarchs in Russia. They would understand that oligarchs in the United States that there's a relationship with the national security state. Just think of J Jeff Bezos and uh, Amazon Web Services' relationship with the CIA. No one would ever say that any of these tech billionaires are not oligarchs who are potentially assets of some aspect of the U.S. national security state. They have a, a working relationship at the very least. This, this same kind of thing, but even more uh, disciplined. That's the, that is the thing I'd say is that is truthful about the pen discipline moment of Putin and Deripaska where he for, where he's disciplining the uh, the uh, critical infrastructure Russian oligarchs to uh, to be better uh, players, to be better national players, you know, be more patriotic players in a way, and that that's one part that I think is is true is that it was showing that the the that uh, Deripaska was being disciplined by the Russian state. That's the deep state. There you go. Just understand that one instance Whitney Webb and then then everything else flows from there in terms of understanding another country another spheres deep state as you know as independent investigators or dissidents or alternative researchers would understand our own uh, country yeah it's <laughs> and then you get the whole idea of when it's convenient to radio Sputnik I guess there are no deep states at least when it comes to um, oligarch influence like uh, Oleg Deripaska, according to Colleen Rowley on Fault Lines, this was all just, um, the former FBI rally, um, this was all just, um, it, um, this was, there was no national interest at stake here. This was all for, for money and influence, and it wasn't, there was no type of national, but then again, if you put it the other way around, um, if it's somebody like, say, Bill Browder and his interest as it relates to Russia, then you better believe there's some type of nationalistic anti-Russian fervor involved there. But when it's somebody working on behalf of uh, what appears to be Russian interest, then that can't be the case. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And then this is then, you, then you got to throw in, not only do you have agents, obviously pa Paul Manafort was an agent for Deripaska. He was just a he was just a guy who liked to wear ostrich suits and spend a lot of money. Yeah, yeah. But then you also have assets, right? Because so then an asset could be turned into an agent, someone who's, you know, doesn't even necessarily, the best asset is someone who doesn't even know that they're being used as an asset of uh, influence, right? And so this, this then you can then begin to see the macro level scope of the power of disinformation and narrative warfare, because then you can have whole scopes of all of us like acting as information assets. And this is why getting the information as truthful as we can to figure out the truth of it and then rhetorically express it in a, in a, uh, you know, a pattern of logic to sort of help make a uh, coherence up here in the midst of that, because you pointed out, Greg, before we started recording, that there's something about this moment too, where it's am there's an amplification of confusion. It's almost like it's like part of the process here is is uh, people being thrown for a loop. And you got to remember that those are parts of like real long term, Sirkovian types. Uh, you know, uh, Vladimir Surkov was that his name? Uh, not Vladimir. Um. Vladislav Surkov. Vladislav Surkov. Thank you, Greg. And that's the way that he would talk about it in terms of, you know, the theater war, right? It was, he was a theater major. So it's a political theater. And that's, you know, I made this connection with, uh, with Richard Silverstein when I did an interview uh, about uh, this sort of interesting dynamic going on geopolitically in the Middle East in relationship to Russia is that you're, you're dealing with theaters of war and then political theater, right? So that, that's a word that's used for very specific reasons, right? That's why information warfare is a key piece of, uh, of uh, kinetic warfare or of a military war, right? And the, uh, you know, so the circle, circle basically points towards that the purpose of this kind of uh, of like creating all kinds of controlled uh, political agents and then assets who follow them 
and a multi a diversity of apparent uh, opinion and of uh, political interests, but it's all being sort of developed by this uh, you know theater warfare guy on behalf of his Putin's great cardinal, right? Uh, is that the, one of the main reasons is not even specific political policy. Now, you can that's a simple way of doing it, right? You have like the Overton window or you have a stalking horse sort of on the side or you have a, you know, a dog to beat or something, you know, like these kinds of archetypes of, of different ways that someone can play a character for a very specific end. But in the Sirkovian uh, political theater warfare dynamics, it's mainly about making people uh, feel like there's no reality, that they can't, they can't know reality, and also that they can't trust anyone, and that no one is for real, and that they, then ultimately that they can't trust themselves. So human beings can only live for so long in like a... Uh, being gaslighted and but even beyond that on steroids in terms of like being uh, pushed into a, a, di a, a an eternal state of of weaponized disbelief for so long so people start turning to you know icons or cults you know information cults uh, and so we see exactly how that went down even in terms of the Trump operation and we're still in the midst of all of that now it's always it's been going on for a long time but that this is an escalation and I think your perception, Greg, that this moment really begins to point to like people don't really quite know exactly what's going on or who to trust or what narrative is is real. And the quick jumping in of the of the sort of the Trump Russia denialists to really spin the shit out of this hardcore. They're trying to they were trying to take over Twitter with like the uh, hashtag uh, collusion, Russia collusion. Right. That's the Russia collusion hoax they didn't leave, they didn't put in the word hoax but the you know the traffic and the bot the sort of network the influencer network and the bots were working the russia collusion quote unquote then hoax angle really intensely and so th i think that points to that there is an uh, opening right now for some kind of coherent uh understanding and that's why we're continuing to get back to this 11 9 uh a cover-up operation. And actually, Greg, was one of the earliest episodes that we did on this Trump 11-9 uh, cover-up operation had to do with this uh, incident uh, that you just put a lot more context to of McCarthy saying that there was two people who had Putin in his pocket, uh, had, that, had, uh, that Putin had in his pocket, Trump and Rohrbacher. And there's a lot more uh, surrounding that, and I, that's where we started in Proof of uh, Conspiracy by Abramson, actually, was fleshing out some of the context, uh, even of that, of what was going on during that time, and the Middle East component of it. All right, here's uh, Timothy Snyder finishing up. Number 18, quote, the Russian influence operation to get Trump elected was real. It serves no one to pretend otherwise. We are still learning about it. Denying that it happened makes the United States vulnerable to ongoing Russian operations. I remember a certain frivolity from 2016. Trump was a curiosity. Russia was irrelevant. Nothing to take seriously. Then Trump was elected, blocked weapon sales to Ukraine, and tried to stage a coup. Now Ukrainians are dying every day in the defining conflict of our time. The McGonagall question goes even beyond these issues. He had authority in the most sensitive possible investigations with, within U.S. intelligence. Sorting this out will require concern for the United States that goes beyond party loyalty. Unquote. And that is the end of the thread. You know, Jeremy, what sticks out to me there, it's just uh, as I'm hearing and looking at this, um, Trump was elected, tried to stage a coup. It's so interesting that um, with hindsight, knowing what you know now that maybe we didn't know before or maybe had a elementary understanding of before, all of that is was just like you look at the history and like, what is known now and what was known then that people um, either kept silent about and or were ignored or ridiculed by the, you know, what we 
by including types of people that we would consider the quote unquote alternative media, truth or media, whatever you want to say, um, it's pretty much inevitable with hindsight that this would be the conclusion of um, of put it, installing somebody like Donald Trump as your as your president and in control of, as they say, you know, the highest office in the land, the most powerful position in the world. Like it just seems like, and then also what Snyder brings in about this, uh, the ongoing um, war with the Ukraine. Um, it's just the, for me, for the domestic side as an American, this is, this was the ultimately um, with hindsight, this was the inevitable outcome, um, almost inevitable outcome is that like, if, uh, if an election didn't go the way that it was said to, and it was telegraphed both in 2016 and 2020, this would be the conclusion of it. And the reason why all this was allowed to take place is because this um, we've been let down in so many ways with the, um, the, yes, the depths of what has been allowed to happen. Definitely. And the, the main point that I really agree with Timothy Snyder on here is that de denying the, that, that, that there was a run for, at the very least, there's a Russian influence operation to get Trump elected. That was real. And denying that it happens happened makes the United States vulnerable. That, though, that I ag totally agree with. And I would go beyond that in many ways by then saying this is where you deal with this counterintelligence Mind you, this is why we've been harping on the long-term compromise of counter of U.S. counterintelligence. Is that counterintelligence in an information war, and then especially after a deep political operation, whether it's an assassination, in an American domestic context, we know all about that. So much it can change their entire scope not only of our national politics, but even of our national psychology, really, right? Or big terror events, 9-11, right? But then also then political warfare operations, like like uh, the 11-9 operation, or then I would say January 6th, that then the main component after the fact, the way that you secure it after you've accomplished your military component, you've actually hit the target, either blown it up, killed them, or, uh, you know, inst uh, effectively installed somebody through elections uh, into a office, then you've already done your intelligence, which is the, uh, the creation of a trail away from you, right? Or, uh, or you might be, that might be the point of the operation. You might be trying to frame somebody, right? Or frame a group of people or frame a nation or a religion or, you know, that kind of scenario or a political uh, ideology. So you have your intelligence set up and then it all comes down to counterintelligence after the fact, whether you're going to get caught for murder in the case of assassination or you're going to get caught for terrorist bombing events in the case of something like 9-11 or you're going to get, you're going to get caught for, uh, major charges of corruption and uh, and uh, espionage and uh, and election laws and money financial uh, trafficking laws and all that in the case of uh, eleven nine counterintelligence the ability to uh, not only muddy the waters because that's sort of the intersection of intelligence and counterintelligence but counterintelligence specifically to aggressively defend against your potential nemeses, right? That's the way it, you might see it. A way of undoing, of aggressively undoing. And then also if your nemeses are making headway in terms of the truth about what you did and why you did it, then you, then you stave them off or you, or you, uh, you know, disable them in some way. So I would just point out that the de denial, the denial of January 6th, this is a very similar networks that deny that even something happened, let, you know, beyond something like a, uh, a political rally gone wrong or something like that for January 6th rather than, yeah, it's, there's seditious conspiracy going on. And uh, the Oath Keepers and the Proud Boys are, you know, low, low to mid-level in, in the scenario, Right. Or just a total denial of Trump, Trump Russia collusion hoax, a denial of eleven nine, 
And then I would then push the Timothy Snyder types in relationship to something like 9-11, which gives an even deeper, more, more vulnerable Achilles heel in relationship to an even bigger operation that goes beyond just Russian influence, you know, and really begins to help us potentially, uh, you know, assess what could be uh, rooted out in terms of high, high level criminal criminality uh, and and conspiracy. And then my second final point, Greg, we should probably wrap this up. Uh, so uh, yeah, here in a little bit. Although I do have one more thing I want to bring in after you make this point. Okay, I'll I'll pass it back to you after this. The other thing is then. This is, uh, like we've been saying, counterintelligence in history, in relationship specifically to the United States. So now there is, you know, he hasn't been proved, like McGonagall has not proven, been proven guilty. This is a case where I imagine where there's smoke, there's fire. At the very least, the head of New York FBI counterintelligence has been r- arrested for, for uh, being a Russian agent. All right, so it's in the realm of we're talking about, you know, the quote-unquote the biggest spy scandals uh, of the quote-unquote Cold War, right? You're talking about Aldrich Ames, right? Robert Hansen, this kind of thing. But all of them point out again, what is the, you know, this is why I also, like, I really do think there's a minimization of the, hum- of the full humanity, really, of like the of Russians and the Russian state and in all its different sort of formats over the years, you know, like to like deny that they are really good. They're really good at counterintelligence. They're like some people said in Bob Bear's book about the fourth man, they, you know, high level CIA people recognize the, the Russians are the best in history at this kind of stuff. We are, we don't even know what they're doing. They're way beyond us. And there's all kinds of reasons that we could explore that ha- might have to do something with our, you know, different forms of government. The fact that we sort of swap out our government very, very often that our, that our sort of real serious deep state, our national security state is younger. If you think about maybe, you know, in relationship, I mean, sure, there's intelligence has been going on in all its forms, right, since the birth of the country and before and all these different networks. But in terms of, like, an institutional basis, like, think about, like, all, you know, the files about Kroichkov and Maxwell that exists or the relationship of Benjamin Netanyahu that exists inside of, like, the, the inner domain of the, of the Russian security state. That stuff didn't go missing. I mean, some of some of it escaped, a, few, a little bit escaped after after the end of the Cold War and after the end of the Soviet Union, but I'd say v- virtually very little of import got lost. You know, only only a, a few nukes got lost. The information at the core of counterintelligence, which was seen as always basically almost a totally obscure inner cave at the core of uh, the Russian security state was the second direct, the second main directorate under the KGB. The first main directorate sort of links up with the, what became the SVR, which is the Russian CIA. So you're talking about foreign intelligence, but the second main directorate is something closer to what we call the FBI in an American context, but what we might now call department of Homeland security but what became the FSB, right? And so remember, Putin was not, Putin survived the transition from the KGB second main directorate to the FSB. And so, so did the, the deep, deep secrets, like interstitial level compromise, compromat, at the level of maybe civilizational compromat, right? These, these are serious people. They were the only serious foe to the United States during decades in terms of uh, co- nuclear capacity and military capacity and political capacity and all of that. And so it's, I feel like it's deleterious to not only the truth, but to like the full humanity of like, you know, other peoples and, uh, and their states. And it's, some of this is very, very, con- you know, like convoluted and there's a lot of overlap and 
you know, and there it's not just in inside one state, but at the very least allow like the Russians to have a national security state and the relationship of the national security state to the oligarchs and the organized crime. Like everyone who's being honest and fairly educated here in the United States knows the way the deep politics actually works. Allow China to have that. Obviously, allow others to have that, too. And so I guess my final point is, if you're thinking about counterintelligence, the best way to, dis, to like disrupt your uh, opponent's intelligence well, then, is by grabbing their counterintelligence and driving it into the ditch. So Angleton, 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 Angleton. Angleton is, in many ways, I would say, the, the World Trade Center of the long-term 11-9 operation, if you're talking about the actual question of the Russian sphere. And this is, this is why it's a touchy subject, and plus the, the forensics are hard to come by. That's all been sort of got done away with, destroyed, or sort of sealed up inside of the U.S. national security state and the few journalists who got any whiff of it. So I'll just say, this begin, don't even think about this only as a single guy. But think of this as a framework of an arch an architecture of compromat, institutional level of compromat. You run the guy who runs the counterintelligence, right? And so final point, right, Angleton, he was not only the head of counterintelligence, he also ran the desk of intelligence for our best ally, Israel. And so this whole relationship, Israel and Russia, this is deep. And it's way more convoluted than people know. Yep. And uh, people, it seems with Russia, people either want to make it all powerful and or powerless, regardless, um, depending on what narrative you're running with. When it's convenient to portray Russia as this um, superpower entity, then that's what the narrative it's ran with. But when it's convenient to portray Russia as like powerless and victimized then um, or sometimes it's a fusion of both of those narratives within certain um, Russian sphere apologist circles so that's very interesting how that works but I think you're right is that you have to take it seriously um, in the way it needs to be evaluated properly so um, I would I agree with you on that and uh, Jeremy I want to bring one final thing into this uh, here I have to wrap up here quickly but um, I want to mention this this piqued my curiosity in one of the comments uh, responses to Timothy Snyder's thread here um, and I looked into this and I found a little bit about this um, this is a person tweeting uh, to Tim Snyder in response to his thread Professor Snyder why was Manafort so determined to have Pence as vice president to the point of faking aircraft trouble to make Trump spend a night in Indiana so they could have dinner with Pence. Why Pence? Um, that's That really piqued my curiosity because um, Pence or Manafort as a campaign manager was said to be the, um, the key the key person in um, recommending Manafort to Trump. And so I started looking and it does turn out that uh, Trump indeed did spend, actually it was breakfast, not dinner, um, according to the New York Times, had mechanical troubles and he was kept he was basically stranded in indianapolis for a night with his plane had mechanical troubles i don't know if paul manafort uh, or anybody orchestrated that but it is kind of a happy coincidence that trump uh, then ended up staying with the pences at um the governor's mansion in indiana um on july of 2016 just before trump Pence was announced as the VP candidate. Uh, this is a there's a New York Times article. It's pretty good that lays this out from uh, July 17, 2016, titled "A Grounded Plane and Anti-Clinton Passion: How Mike Pence Swayed the Trumps." And it goes into the case, makes the case that Pence um, basically used this opportunity to have breakfast with Trump, who was there because he was kept overnight in Indianapolis because of these uh, mechanical problems with his plane. Um, that Pence used the opportunity to sell himself to Trump. Now, I could see a bit of maybe an innocuous version of this by the New York Times that this was simply Pence sold Trump on his anti-Clinton bona fides and his conservative bona fides and all this, where I think maybe there's more going on than just that. But on a surface level, it makes sense. And it does beg the question once again, Paul Manafort, Mike Pence, why? And I think for me, um, where we go with this, uh, I think you'll agree with me on this, Jeremy, is that Mike Pence, with hindsight, was perfect for Donald Trump. Uh, 
as a as a VP. And the reason for that would be that Mike Pence was a perfect bridge between um, the the Trump, who was an outsider, quote unquote outsider, which he really was by American political standards, and the inner workings of the American um, right wing political establishment. Um, and also the men Manafort also with the Russian interests at heart understood the power of the culture wars in the Russian role with that with the um, building of the relationships between Russians and American evangelicals that were um, crucial to the narrative surrounding the culture wars as we keep talking about this twin pillar of the war global terror war and the global culture war and Mike Pence was perfect for that with all the connections he had he was seen as this squeaky clean evangelical um, who knew all the big players and also that also brings into play the both the culture war agenda and the domestic um, long-term uh, economic and policy agenda of the uh, Council for National Policy and its offshoot think tanks and organizations that had a very specific, it seems, a uh, long-term economic and uh, domestic policy agenda to go along with the culture wars and, of course, the uh, neocon wars, which uh, Mike Pence is perfect for all of those. So it is interesting, and I don't know if there's anything to it, but it is a might have been a happy coincidence that Donald Trump was stranded in Indianapolis for a night with Mike Pence to sell himself on why, have breakfast with the Trump family and sell himself on why he should be the VP, and then Donald Trump picks him. And I think this was, um, at the very least, it's a deliberate um, strategic move to have Pence in there as the VP choice because I think he was perfect for a lot of reasons. And then the, and then the passing along of the torch from Paul Manafort directly into the domestic uh, Council for National Policy um, interest, also combined with the foreign interests of uh, Breitbart, Made in America, Conceived in Israel, of uh, Steve Bannon coming on as the head of the campaign after uh, Manafort stepped down because of uh, the disclosure of payments to Yanukovych interestingly enough. So this, this is very interesting. I did not know about these mechanical failures. I don't know if they mean anything, but it is coincidental at the very least. And it very well could have been something that was purposely prearranged to get the guy who Paul Manafort may have ultimately wanted on behalf of, I think, these um, Russian interests, I would say. Uh, Mike Pence as this perfect candidate for, I believe, the reasons laid out here. But uh, this this is interesting. And I didn't know about this little story of the mechanical failures which led Trump to stay with Pence and perhaps be swayed in the direction of picking Mike Pence as his VP. But I would say this makes a lot of sense. Definitely. And these are the forensic details of what was sort of notoriously known uh, that that uh, Pence was was the Manafort choice for Trump. And then this then can show the actual, you know, the nature of how things actually uh, happen. And because, of course, the the like you're pointing out really well, Pence also delivered the bridge from Manafort, who was campaign manager when these kinds of choices were going down and serving sort of a pri primarily his main money interest, obviously, was to make himself whole with with uh, in most intensely Russian interests, right? And then after that gets exposed and these kinds of decisions are already in the, you know, in the make, then the campaign gets shifted over to this uh, Steve Bannon, which has this, you know, run in the Death Star, <laughs> Breitbart, obviously, you know, made in, made in America, conceived in Israel scenario, right? Which also, by the way, was the network then, then some of this <laughs> Paul Manafort uh, Russian sphere uh, propaganda was run via then the Ministry of Strategic Affairs in Israel, it looks like, we're straight into then Ben Shapiro at Breitbart, right? And so Pence... Cultivating the narrative of um, the anti-Semites in the Yanukovych, or the Yushchenko government, or of the anti-Semites that were opposed to Yanukovych and acting on behalf of the Clinton State Department, which became a part of the groundwork basis for the Ukro nazis And uh, it's interesting that uh, Ben Shapiro plays a role that a lot of people would be either in denial, simultaneously in denial, and probably horrified to find out that uh, this was signal boosted initially in part by Ben Shapiro via Israel's uh, Department of Strategic Affairs and Paul Manafort. Definitely. 
And I think your larger point is really crucial, which is that Pence was the perfect choice for the culture war dynamics and maybe even, you know, towards the core of the reasons for the longer term parts of the 11-9 operation and Trump specifically. And this background there with the, the network, the CNP networks, Council for National, National Policy Networks, maybe as the sort of most uh, obvious in terms of the, the CFR of the sort of right counter group of something like that is the way it begins to look. And it brings together these kinds of networks that will agree on the culture war. Uh, from a religious dynamic in the kind of way that develops this much long, longer relationship between certain aspects of right-wing Christian evangelicals and specifically the political organization surrounding them and uh, elements of the, of the Russian sphere for decades on end. And so Pence is, is I agree, he sort of stabilizes the Trump ticket He's an insider. He knows the the way, but he also then smooths the bridge to this this really deep culture war. And so my final point is that if you're fighting a culture war, if you're fighting the culture war, you are the the culture. This is the way I say it. The culture war is something like a Serkovian psyop. It's it's as if Vladislav Serkov. Uh, you know, was around a longer time ago and created the dynamics of long-term political warfare. So if you're fighting a culture war, which is a, it, which is a Serkovian psyop, no matter what side you think you're in on it, you are a dupe. You're a useful idiot of all the different elements, including domestic and quote-unquote foreign elements that are not, are not have, don't have your best interests in mind here in your own home, wherever it may be. So forget the, forget the culture war. Focus on politics. Let's actually get back to real politics, real polit I call it real deep politique, or deep real politique. And that then will then get us into things not only about deep, deep problem sets, but also deep solution sets, of which there are many, and which of which... There are a, a ways, a, a prince, principle-based fashion to actually have a full-spectrum political conversation, and I would then think an alliance uh, wherever we may be, where we're not on one side of some kind of domestic culture war. No one wins a domestic civil culture war. Yeah, and um, and my last point to follow up on that will be that. Um, we see the dangers of this now with the escalation after four years of Trump and everything that's come along with it in the aftermath and the attempted January 6th coup and all that's come with it. And now um, I think this is perfectly or almost perfectly summed up by Governor Ron DeSantis, the hopeful for the maybe the MAGA that's ready to move on from Donald Trump. Uh, Florida is where woke comes to die and this global international um, escalation of this. Um, it's been going on for a couple decades now, but the escalation of it to the level it's at now where you have a Ron DeSantis and all the questions surrounding him that are still unanswered. And the um, the Marjorie Taylor Greene wing of the GOP coming into all of this power and influence with um, all and then a bunch of unsettled questions there. Basically, it looks like it's the January 6th, the pro January 6th elements of uh, the Republican House uh, coming into power and uh, with the influence and the sway now. And uh, this is the fruits of a, this linking together, this unholy alliance, you might call it, of Trump and Pence. And um, the that, yeah, the culture war is definitely a, um, it, this would not have happened. Another consequence would not have happened with all that we're seeing play out now and just how escalated it's been almost to, if we're not careful, almost to a point of no return in terms of the domestic um, undermining that's been done of like our stability and of things that could bring people together, common interests. Uh, and if this uh, continues on unabated, then it will be a successful attempt to just irreparably split up and divide us as a society. And that is a one of the maybe the biggest overall um, domestic level 
achievement of this multinational operation to install Donald Trump and everything that came with it. Definitely. So maybe similarly as uh, the New York FBI field office was where tips of massive international uh, political influence operations went to die, then maybe to be more accurate in terms of the weaponization of the culture war, DeSantis's Florida is where uh, black American history uh, comes to die or it comes to be lynched maybe. Mm. Or, or maybe, maybe DeSantis's Florida is where Palestinian human dignity uh, comes to have a white phosphorus dropped on it. But hopefully this Florida will just end up being the place where uh, DeSantis's uh, scummy political career goes to die. Indeed, and that's a, I can't think of a better way to finish it off than that, so um, we'll call it a show with that. All right. Thank you very much, Greg. And we'll dig back into um, proof of conspiracy in our next recording. Definitely. We'll finish the part of the chapter four that we didn't finish uh, so far, and it will give really good, helpful, larger geopolitical context to this specific uh, uh, moment, actually. All right. Thank you, everybody. We appreciate you. Until next time, Antidote, we are out. Thank you.